Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sandy Clark. I'm president of the Seacoast African American Cultural Center, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the second in this 2018 series of the Eleanor Williams Hooker Tea Talks. Um, today's talk is on black men as ritual sacrifice for the creation of white identity, and it'll be presented by Reverend Ian White Marr. Um, I'd also like to take a second to say, as you all know, we are videotaping um, this tea talk as we have in the past. Um, it will be on YouTube. It'll also be on the um, PMBT, which is the Portsmouth Public Media TV. And then eventually it'll also be on the um, Black Heritage Trails website. So just so everybody knows, smile. It'll be on TV. <laughs> um, at this time, I'd like to invite, there she is, Laura from the Public Library. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Laura Horwood Benton. I'm the Public Programming and Community Relations Librarian here. Um, so I'd just like to say hi so you know that you can look for me um, or any other library staff member if you have suggestions or questions or comments about the programs that we offer here at the library. We are so, so excited to partner with the Black Heritage Trail and help host this event. Um, I do want to mention that out by the door there is um, a calendar with all of our upcoming events and one that I wanted to tell you about that's not on there because it's not till March is the continuation of our Showing Up for Racial Justice film series in collaboration with Showing Up for Racial Justice the Southern Maine chapter. Where are they? I got it right. Yay. Um, <laughs> um, so we're really excited to, to host that and you can find more information in the lobby or by asking me. Um, I do want to say that the library really likes to host events where we can come together as a community and have a civil and respectful conversation about controversial issues and topics that, are affect, that affect our society. So thank you all for coming and being here. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Jerry Ann. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm just making a few announcements today and we'll try to make them quickly so we can get on to what you all came here for, the talk. And I just want to remind you that this, these are dialogues, so in order for a dialogue to really take place, we have to have communication from both sides. So please be ready to participate, to ask questions, to share your opinions, thoughts, and so that we can all learn from this experience. And just a few announcements from the trail. One of the things we're really excited about is if you um, do a lengthened practice, we collaborated with the Episcopal Church of New Hampshire, and starting on Wednesday, they'll be doing um, the 40 Days of Lent by reading stories of African Americans in New Hampshire, starting from early till contemporary times, one day, every day, for the next 40 days. So if you want to part participate, you can go online at our website and you'll see that. And you can learn about the men and women um, of New Hampshire all across the state. Our next one is please remember to, if you want to um, learn about uh, Mr. Potter, this is one of our events that won't be at the library. It will be at the temple. So you have to register for that because space is limited. Um, you don't have, we have a tour, a reenactor, and the presentation by the new author, but you don't have to all, do all three, you just have to register. Next week's talk is going to be Sites of Memory Reconstructing the Past. I'm sure you'll get another notice from us before next week, so we hope to see you here again for that. And if you are Tweeters and Facebook people, please join us on social media. Tweet out about today's talk. Join us and tell your friends. That's my announcements for today. I'll pass you back. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to ask you all to join me in welcoming Reverend Ian White Marr. Uh, before I start, I, um, I just want to, a couple of thank yous. Um, first, I want to thank Valerie Cunningham, who uh, has been supporting me. Uh, I think we first met in 1998, when I was a tour guide on the Black Heritage Trail in Boston. Um, 
I think she dragged my mom down there. I'm not, I think I felt like we were both there at this, they were all there at the same time. And she's been a, just a very strong advocate of my work and I really appreciate it. Um, and Jerry and uh, Bogus, thank you so much for helping me putting this together. A little bit of a primer. Um, there is at least one slide in here that includes a lynching image. Now, you may not have known that when you were coming, so uh, that, you know, that may be a triggering uh, thing for you. So I'm going to let you know when it's coming, and you'll be able to sort of look away or turn, turn away if you want. Um, and I'll let you know when it's off the screen. But I, you know, I wanted to let you know that it's there. Uh, and it's there because this, you know, this is the reality of, of what I'm about to talk about. Um, but nevertheless, I'll give you some warning, because it's not easy. But first, I would like to start with this image. Now, who can tell me what this is an image of? Yeah, I know. So I, ha I, I have a sexy voice. <laughs> um, no, I always forget. I get shy, and I, I speak softly. Um, so this is a slave ship. There's no text on this image, though, so, so how do you know? Well, I mean, there's uh, men and women, but how do you know that it's a slave ship. <coughs> I'm going to suggest that you know that it's a slave ship because you've seen it before. This image is an iconic image. It's an image that is uh, tied to our identities. It's an image that tells part of the story of the Americas. You don't actually have to have a title on it to know what it is because it really has become part of our story. And that story is that Africans were kidnapped and sold into slavery. But I'd like you to look at this image a little more closely and tell me what you see. What is the story that this image is telling? Packed in. And I really want to focus on that. Packed in, right? This image is a complete fabrication. Why do I say that? In part because it is told in an unconscious way, right, that there was passivity and acquiescence on the behalf of Africans in their enslavement. And this was never true. Africans never lined up like this in the hold of a slave ship. They always resisted, they always fought back. And what is absent from this image are all of the Europeans, later known as white people, that were needed to force that many Africans in that position. So when you see this image, what you're seeing is a fabrication. Now, all of the white people have been erased from this photo, but I assure you that they are there. They had to be there because human beings never willingly comply to uh, these types of situations. These, they never willingly live in these types of conditions. So when we talk about the conditions of African Americans uh, today, you know, if there's one point that I can make, it is that it takes a system of people to force other human beings to live in unhealthy situations. But very often, we, er we erase the enforcers from the image, from the story. And we do this because as white people, we control the imagery and we remove ourselves from the conversation of race. A race is something that other people have. Racism is a problem for people of color. Racism is a problem of people of color. So I was born and raised uh, right here in Portsmouth, in New Hampshire state that is over 90% white. And when I was growing up, as I'm sure some of you also heard, uh, people said to me, you know, we don't have a race problem. We don't have that many black people here. And this type of comment locates the problem of race and racism squarely on people of color. And it erases white people from being part of the problem. That is, it's only a problem when a person of color shows up. 
and that's incorrect. The problem exists already, and it reveals itself when a person of color shows up, which means the problem lives within the existence of white people. And I don't say existence in the sense of the lived reality of of the people that we call white. I mean in the social and cultural designation of a people called white. I mean uh, that that white is a fabrication and it is a fabrication that is relatively new to human history. But we, as white people, because we control the imagery and dominate the public sphere, we, for the most part, decide when and how we want to talk about race. And more often than not, that means race as it relates to people of color. But white people are also racialized. And today, what I'm going to talk about is, in part, that racialization process for white people. Now, some of the theory behind this lecture originated when I uh, was leading classes in Massachusetts for men convicted of battering their partners or children. And the courts would assign these men to me and a coworker for 40 weeks with the hope of changing their abusive patterns of the physical, emotional, psychological, sexual abuse. And our goal was not to get men uh, to admit that they were wrong. Uh, Many would admit that abuse was wrong within the first few sessions, within the first session. But rather, our goal was to change the belief systems that these men held about women, the belief systems that guided their behaviors. It is belief systems of male superiority and female inferiority that gave justification for their behavior. Abusive behavior is an external manifestation. It is a product of the belief system. So it's in this vein of understanding that I I want to talk about racism, whiteness, and white superiority today. That is, most white people will very quickly admit that racism is bad, and that we may have even engaged in hopefully small external manifestations of racism, acts of racism. But the manifestation of racism you know, that's what we demonize and, and sometimes even criminalize, but it is the belief system of white superiority that guides our identities and our actions, and it's really here in the area of the belief systems that I want to explore. The external manifestations, the acts of racism, are important, uh, and we need to confront them. But if we're not addressing the belief systems that guide this behavior, that create this behavior, that generate this behavior, then we're not really committed to ending the external manifestations of racism. So this lecture focuses on the ritual sacrifice of black men in particular as an instrument for creating a cohesive and unified body of people called white. And racism is more than a black and white issue, uh, so I am just looking at a very narrow uh, aspect of how race is used and the, uh, how the belief system about race functions in our society. And um, so I don't want to go too far into, well, it works over this, to, uh, you know, I'm looking at a very narrow focus. Um, but I hope that it will um, give you insight into other areas uh, of how race is used, particularly in the political climate we're in right now. So I uh, purposely did not say belief, but rather belief system, because superiority is not a single idea that stands on its own, Um, that we can isolate in some people and not in others. Belief systems are fundamental. They are uh, interconnected values that we develop and choose to help guide our behaviors. Belief systems, like opinions, unlike opinions, are not uh, clearly identifiable on a cognitive level and can't be compartmentalized, but are understood as informing multiple areas of our identities and our lives. They have the ability to morph, especially when we are presented with inconsistencies that, we would, uh, that would force a sacrifice in our beliefs. So for example, right now we're dealing with the fact that the biology of race has been completely and utterly destroyed, that there is no biology to race. And yet, the belief system of white superiority, which once used that so handily, uh, has found a way to morph 
uh, and it doesn't depend so much on science anymore. Uh, but it's found another way to sort of justify its existence, and the belief system will change over time so that it doesn't have to lose power. So let me see if I know how to do this. So there's been a great deal written about interracial struggle. Uh, that is, between whites and people of color. Uh, visible signs of economic success by African Americans or other uh, person of color groups are often cited as the cause for racist actions and reactions by whites. And uh, to some degree, this is true. Uh, but I also believe that it's not the whole answer, and we would really be well served by examining intra white racial struggle as well as source for sources of racist actions and reactions. By focusing solely on the interracial struggle, we perpetuate the myth that there is one cohesive uh, white body of people that is indeed guided by a singular set of values rather than a disparate group with disparate values that are brought together through a counterfeit identity of inclusion, a counterfeit identity of inclusion that serves the ruling segment of society. I'm certainly not suggesting that we abandon our investigations into the interracial struggles, but by solely focusing here, we avoid looking at how the image and message of race is manipulated by ruling elites as a form of social control over non-ruling class whites to ameliorate intra-white struggle to make it less dangerous to the social order. So when I say intra-white struggle, I mean the conflict and the competition that exists between different groups that live under this massive tent that we call whiteness. And it's, it's really an amazing feat, a, a testimony to the belief system that uh, you, you and I believe we have more in common with someone in the Ukraine because we live with this thing called white than we do with the person of color who actually lives next door. It is a phenomenal uh, it's a phenomenal success, that belief system. So, oh, that gets me a little head. We'll hold on. Uh, so commenting on the ease with which the many are governed by the few, Edmund Morgan in his book uh, Inventing the People writes, all governments rest on the consent of the governed. Human beings, if only to maintain a semblance of self-respect, have to be persuaded. Their consent must be sustained by opinions. The success of governments thus require the acceptance of fictions. Fictions are necessary. We cannot live without them. Uh, but when we're confronted by them, we often go through great we, we make great pains to prevent their collapse rather than move on from the fiction. Uh, Morgan later adds, uh, not only authority but liberty, which seems to be so much of our identity as Americans, liberty too may depend on fictions. Indeed, liberty may depend, however uh, deviously, on the fiction that supports the authority. So what he means by this is that uh, liberties have been declared for us, and we, we know this because we have this constitution and this, uh, you know, politicians talking about it, uh, Declaration of Independence. Liberties have been declared for us. But they have been declared for us by authority figures. And to the degree to which we agree with these liberties is the degree to which we agree with the right of the authorities to define the meaning of our culture. Now, I know that sounds a little complicated, but I'll, I'll get into it more. But by accepting that idea, we tacitly and actively give our support and uh, we legitimize the authorities that have proclaimed these liberties for us. It's a concept of government, a we the people that regulates society. But when we think about that phrase, we the people, was there, was the, the people really a concept before it was declared for us? Who is this people that Jefferson refers to? 
Whiteness is similar in that it's a concept that regulates society. If we were to substitute the word whiteness for government, uh, Morgan's passage would read that whiteness exists because there are many who are willing to believe that it exists and that it requires a certain suspension of disbelief in the face of contradictory facts, and the liberties provided by whiteness are contingent on recognizing the authority that granted them to us. I'm a minister, so I think about things in religious, you know, through a framework. Can't get away from it. Uh, but I also uh, believe that... Uh, Religion is a product of the human imagination, and we seek to interpret the world around us. I don't believe that there is a pre-existing religion out there uh, that is external to our experience, something that is isolated and separate from the human experience. I believe uh, that we interpret and make meaning through religion. This doesn't make religion any less valid as an experience, but it's not ontological. We are actors in it, and uh, if we look to the stories that we tell about creation, the stories of our origin, we can see our motivations, we can see our desires, we can see our projections on who we want to be and who we want to be seen as, uh, as people. So for example, let's take uh, the most famous creation story in our culture, Genesis. What is the story of Genesis? Gosh, all of you failed something. I don't believe it. What's the story of Genesis? Adam and Eve. What else? Seven days. So whenever I give this talk to a Unitarian crowd, somewhere in there they're like, there's two stories! <laughs> and I'm like, yes. There's... So there are two stories, right? Two stories in the Hebrew Scripture. One right after the other. You actually don't even get off this, the first page if you've got a big book. Um, so, and they, they actually slightly contradict each other, right? So in the first story, first seven days, uh, man and woman were created on the sixth day. Uh, and they were made at the same time. And all of the plants and everything else was made before them. And you don't even flip the page, uh, because the chapter's not really that long. And you're already getting another story where man is created first, plants come into being, and then woman is made. And we want to believe the book, uh, or a lot of people do. And so we've got to find a way in our minds to make the story coherent, and we fit uh, facts in such a way to keep it that coherent. Now, I'm not here to call it a fiction, because I don't, you know, I don't believe that creation stories are bad. Um, we get a lot of meaning from creation stories. That's how we orient our world. But whole careers have been made out of you know, finding ways to synthesize those two stories. And when we talk about the American people, what is the creation story that we tell? Where do we locate ourselves? Where is the beginning? The pilgrims. That's where we start. When we start talking about, uh, but it's also a fiction, right? When we tell the story of the United States, we begin with the arrival of the pilgrims in Plymouth in 1620, the beginning of the, our, our country, and it serves here, it's a perp there's a purpose, right? It locates the origin of our culture in a body of free thinkers, of a body of people willing to face persecution for believing differently than the king, and uh, we think that that says something about ourselves. So we lift up the pilgrims and we see them as agents of their own destiny. Earnest, hardworking, dedicated, pious, a little bit murderous. That's a, that's a new revisionist part that's come into the story. But until quite recently, right, that they were these earnest, hardworking people. And whether, we, uh, um, and whether they, they lived as we imagined them to live is really beside the point, because what we're interested in is the story that we tell about them, because that's the story we tell about ourselves. But as with the Bible, there are two creation stories for Anglo United States. There is the sanctified story of uh, Plymouth, 
And then who wants to take a guess at the other story? Vikings. Well, <laughs> a- Anglo. Let's keep it just within the Anglo group, but also correct. Also. So within Anglo, the Anglo. Virginia. Virginia, exactly. Jamestown, Virginia. Founded in 1607, so 13 years before uh, Plymouth. It was a speculative stockholding venture with the majority of the uh, investors never leaving England. Jamestown was the first permanent English uh, settlement in what was to become the United States. Plymouth is the sanctified story, and Jamestown is the story of the origins of capitalism. It is also the site of introduction of Africans, African bond labor for the accumulation of capital. And while we don't necessarily talk about the creation stories on equal terms, it is around these two central stories, religion and capitalism, that the citizens of this nation have come to define themselves regardless of color. These values spelled out in our creation stories are part of our belief system. And communities of color have added additional creation stories, stories of origin. But due to the dominance of the Anglo story, it, that, that uh, the Jamestown uh, Plymouth story define a lot of the central value of the national identity and the, every culture uh, has been forced to incorporate the white creation stories into their story. Now the English came to Jamestown and they were very different than the pilgrims. Uh, Theodore Allen contends that the English colonial motivations uh, included not only a desire for conquest like the other European nations, but colonialism was also seen as a means to vent the nation of a surplus of necessitous people, and that England abounded with swarms of idle persons having no means of labor to relieve their uh, misery. That is, uh, there were a lot of poor people that were causing a lot of problems, and they didn't know what to do with them so they had to get rid of them. So following the peasant uprising of the English Midlands in 1607, the same year as the founding of Jamestown, the House of Lords looked to both war and colonization to vent a dangerous and dissatisfied element of the population that represented a threat to the stability of society. And this was one reason why of the 11 to 15 million Africans that were kidnapped for enslavement, only 500,000 were brought to these shores. The ruling elite sent large numbers of Europeans here to work the land to get rid of them. And this is part of the story of Jamestown. Now, we don't tell this story because as white people, we like to see ourselves as agents We like to think of ourselves in the model of the pilgrims rather than as vented people who were uh, dismissed because we were, uh, you know, sent to the plantation. Now, we do not talk about the plantation system, which has become synonymous with the enslavement of African Americans, uh, but the plantation pass the sexual exploitation of servant women, the whipping post, the uh, slave chain, the branding iron, and the overseer were all mechanisms that were tried out and perfected on early vented Europeans, some of which you may come from. Now these facts are inconvenient to the story that we tell about ourselves, so we bend the facts to fit the fiction. Equally inconvenient is the story of African-American landholders. So Allen points out that in 1666, so Jamestown had been around for just about 60 years, 59 years, in Northampton County, Virginia, which is where Jamestown is, 10.9%, almost 11% of African-Americans and 17.6% of Europeans were landholders. So the difference was not too great at that point. And that is fascinating because uh, 53.4% of the European American landholders came as free people, but none of the Africans did. So this is an inconvenient story uh, to whiteness because what is it, uh, you know, who does it serve when the story is that bondage always meant lifetime and hereditary slavery rather than recognizing that at one point in our history, 
It meant that there was a term limit and that land ownership was possible for African Americans. Who does it serve for nearly every person in this room, regardless of ethnicity, to believe that slavery was consistent in definition from the earliest days all the way through the Civil War when it was not, when in fact it was created, built up, and modified over many years? It serves those who are invested in having us believe in a cohesive and consistent understanding of white identity. The story says that there is a permanence to our separation and that we have always understood ourselves as distinct races when we did not. We have bent the facts to fit the fiction on which our society relies and requires us to believe. Now, some it does not mean that we didn't, didn't see, see skin, skin color. color. We, we, we obviously, obviously saw, saw the difference in skin, skin color. But, but race, race, as we, as we understand, understand race, race, is more than, than skin, skin color. color. It is, it is about, about a sense, sense of worth, worth and, and particularly a value, value hierarchy, hierarchy based on skin color, which is something that we created. And if we do not, if we give up this fiction, it would actually rend our society, it seems right now, because we, we, I don't think we would know who we were. Now, the first documented case of lifetime bondage came as punishment in 1660. It was a runaway laborer of African descent named John Punch. And he fled the plantation system with two other bond laborers of European descent who were punished with additional years to their indenture, but they were not given lifetime bondage. So we see two things. First, that John Punch was unwilling to submit to even limited term bond servitude. And second, the willingness of at least some of the plantation elite to equate African descent people with lifetime bondage. But the real shift in thinking happens among the plantation elite uh, following an armed uprising against the plantation system in 1676 called Bacon's Rebellion, where both Africans and European American bond servants rose up against the plantation system. And it was actually the last example of this happening. The process of racialization, that is the assigning of a pejorative or elevated significance to ethnic origins, uh, followed this uprising and it was created through an intentional effort by plantation elite to undo laboring class solidarity. The vast majority of European Americans were not landowners, so in order uh, to separate the laborers into two groups, a screen of racial contempt was created and cultivated within the community by legislating black as negative and elevating white as positive. And they did this through the legal system, which is the text of our society. And some of those laws uh, include um, uh, Africans not being able to be set free, but uh, you, know, you can whip a white Christian, uh, you can't whip a white Christian naked, uh, but you can whip uh, an African American naked, um, barring African Americans from serving as witnesses against whites. Um, not allowing white people to be in the company of slaves. There were all sorts of ways to, uh, there was a, oh yeah, this was a great one. Um, free Negro subject to 30 lashes uh, for lifting a hand against any European American, which essentially denies that person the elementary right of self-defense. So bit by bit, you can see where the, the, the dates are slowly coming, right? They're adding through the text uh, a different sense of justice, but also what's created is a separation within the culture of who is better and who is worse. These laws were created intentionally to separate people of similar class and cultural experience. So Alan writes, uh, instead of social mobility, uh, European Americans who did not own uh, bond laborers were asked to simply be satisfied with the presumption of liberty. The prospects for stability of a system of capitalist agriculture based on lifetime hereditary bond servitude depended on the ability of the ruling elite to induce, to convince, to 
persuade the non-landowning European to settle for a concept of counterfeit social mobility. The solution was to establish a new birthright for the Anglos, uh, not only for the Anglos, but for every uh, Euro-American, this white identity which set them at a distance, set us at a distance from the laboring class of African Americans, and then to use them, to enlist them as active or at least passive supporters of lifetime bondage of African Americans, which is all built up through this time. Essentially, you are told you are better, so you feel like you've moved up, whether your situation has changed or not. The mobility is not real, but this presumption of liberty, this concept, requires us to believe in the authorities that told us we had these liberties. And our acceptance of, the, of these ideas, in a way, grants the authorities their legitimacy. The establishment of white identity uh, drew together the wealthy slave-owning class and the small landowner, and then the vast numbers of white laborers and tenants through a common social bond. Uh, not only did it put an end to class-based rebellions, like Bacon's Rebellion, but citing Thomas Wharton Baker, every white man, no matter how degraded, could now find pride in his race. Moreover, the immediate control of the Negroes fell almost entirely into the hands of white men of humble means, which is something we still see today. Now, let's not get uh, stuck understanding the enslavement movement in strictly political terms. The development of being white as a belief system is not uh, only compartmentalized in the political and historical concepts of who we are, but also, I believe, in the religious, in how we tell our creation stories, how we give ourselves our sources of meaning, and how we locate ourselves as beings with meaning. That whiteness holds religious values in addition to the more familiar secular ones. So, in this development of the screen of racial contempt uh, that I'm calling the first stage of sacrifice, while it certainly includes the murder of African Americans, it was, it was the murder of their humanity in the eyes of European Americans that was sacrificed in the development of white identity. More than just debasement, it was the symbolic murder of their identities offered up in order to engender another identity. So René Girard uh, writes, the purpose of sacrifice is to restore the harmony to community, to reinforce the social fabric, and that the common denominator that exists between, behind all sacrifice is internal violence. And the dissensions, the rivalries, the jealousies, and the quarrels of the community by design are suppressed by sacrifice. So where does he see this? Girard isolates three distinct bodies within the community, the model, the rival, and the ritual victim. And he sees within the community a driving function of competition and the potential for violence. So the model, in our case, the plantation elite or elite whites, are in possession of an object. They're in possession of something. In the political realm, we might think of this solely as capital, but if we think of it more broadly, they're really in possession of something called white, which stands for all sorts of things, concepts of election, purity, goodness, and providence. And I was uh, doing research in the in Widener Library at Harvard, and they, they had this book, um, and it had something like the 23 races of English people, which, which sounds surprising, right, but not really. Right? It all feeds into that chain moving towards the elite model, the person uh, who is holding the desirable quality at the top. Now, elites are able to generate allegiance, uh, uh, and they are able to generate disciples by making whiteness a desirable quality. European laborers didn't know they had whiteness before uh, it was actually proclaimed for them. But the authorities, through a system of laws, gave it value. 
And this counterfeit social mobility that Allen refers to is more than just uh, the possibility of capital accumulation. It is also the growing nearer to purity, the growing nearer and the signifier of divinity. Whiteness was created as a belief system on the desire of an object embodied by the plantation elites or by elites in general. And by model, it meant uh, being closer to God. The rival, uh, the second group that Girard speaks of, are the uh, European American masses uh, who try to possess this whiteness as an act of mimicry by desiring what the model desires, what the elites have. Uh, and we all understand this sensation. In, in the most primitive fashion, anybody who has picked up a, a People magazine or a Us Weekly, they are all designed based on this model, right? You leaf through the pages, and what do you see? You see celebrity. And they're designed to create in you a sense of desire to be like that celebrity or to want that celebrity life, right? I don't want to be Brad Pitt, but I sure desire that thing, whatever that thing is that Brad Pitt has, right? This celebrity thing, this, this fame thing, this, this, he is loved by people, whatever it is. We don't really have a name for it, but we know we want it. And, and at the same time, this is the other side of that competition, who has not hated those same celebrities for simply being celebrities? We look at the Us Weekly and the People magazine, and we say, oh, that's trash. We would do that. And then we're at the dentist's office. <laughs> it's, it is this same, it is a call and rejection that lives within it. They want me to want it. Because so much as I want it, they have power. Me wanting it gives them stature. Us Magazine, People Magazine, uh, cultivate the culture of celebrity because it gives the system more power. Same with the Oscars. Same with all that stuff, right? Some, I, I have no problem with entertainment, but there, within that thing, there is that drive. And it's not just celebrity. You can see it elsewhere as well. Politics, sports. Girard warns us uh, that the desires of the rival, the second group, or the masses, will grow. The desire will grow until there is violence induced by that competition that's there. The nature of the system is that it, it wants us to desire, but it doesn't want us to go too far. Because if we want it too much, eventually, we will try to knock over, we will try to kill the model so that we can replace the model, right? So the system doesn't want us to go too far, so it needs to find a way to blow off steam through the process. They don't want to get rid of that intra-community violence, but they just want to deflect it before it reaches the doors of the elites. So ultimately, the system seeks to keep the internal competition intact by inducing mimicry so the masses... Uh, uh, they, they control the masses by uh, creating desire, but the generation of desire within the common people to be like the elites uh, is also how we get to believe that they are right. So de to deflect the violence that ultimately arises out of the competition, there needs to be a ritual victim, which is the third group. Someone who is marginal within the community, who does not represent a real threat of reprisal, who can't attack the system back. The dangers uh, in this society are projected onto that victim. So I'm going to step outside of my, uh, you know, for the rest of this I'm doing sort of a black-white thing, but I'm going to step outside because there is a very easy way to understand this. Ruling elites white people have been sending jobs overseas because it's cheaper and they make more money. Working class whites say, that's not fair. What happened to my jobs? They get upset with the ruling elites. The ruling elites turn around and say, it wasn't me, it was... Exactly. You all know this narrative by heart, right? It is not the Mexicans. 
It is the ruling elites. But they enter this story in to keep us from going to their house and murdering them. Which we probably should do. <laughs> but we don't do it. Because uh, somehow, you know, but what happens is people end up going and murdering Mexicans. This is the process, right? That's the process of sacrifice. So, Bacon's Rebellion, 1676. Represented is a violence that grew out of control. The development of whiteness and the, and the creation of the polluted black person, the concept of race, all stems out of this. And, uh, and it comes as a cycle of social control. So when we think about the legalization of a contempt for black people, we are also seeing the space created for ritualistic quelling of competition through acts of violence on black people. And most often, we want to think of religion as a good thing, a process of getting closer to the divine. But we would be remiss to neglect this aspect of whiteness as an understood belief system of getting closer to the concept of purity and instructing us to adhere to certain prohibitions and perform certain rites that maintain the purity of the belief system of the religion of whiteness. Miscegenation might be a very clear one. White women are not purity in themselves, but they are the vessels of purity. They hold the bloodline. Miscegenation became a prohibition because it violates that system of purity. Mary Douglas, anthropologist, ironically enough, doing most of her research in Africa, writes, dirt is essentially disorder. There is no such thing as absolute dirt. It exists in the eye of the beholder. Dirt offends against order. Eliminating it is not a negative movement, but a positive effort to organize the environment. It serves a purpose. You don't want to get rid of dirt. You just want to know where it is and how to deal with it. So I am clear, in our society, black is her dirt. Black is... A, is, is eliminated to organize our environment. She adds, for us, sacred things and places need to be protected from defilement, and defilement is never an isolated event. It cannot occur except in, uh, in view of a systematic ordering of ideas. Also, if uncleanliness is, uh, a, is a matter of out of place, we must approach it through order. Uncleanliness or dirt is that which must not be included if a pattern is to be maintained. To recognize this is the first step towards insight into pollution. So what does that mean? Dirt, or the polluted body, must both maintain a relationship to the system for it to have significance, what would be white if you did not have black, but it must not be allowed into the system of whiteness. Douglas writes, persons of marginal state are somehow left out of the patterning of society. They are uh, placeless. Uh, they may be doing nothing wrong, but a polluting person is always wrong. He has developed some wrong condition or simply crossed some line which should not have been crossed, and this displacement unleashes danger. Danger for someone who finds their meaning in a pattern system. Lastly, the analysis of the ritual symbol cannot begin until we recognize ritual as an attempt to create and maintain a particular culture, a particular set of assumptions by which experience is controlled. So let me try to wrap that up, illustrate this point. And I'll do it by moving into some more contemporary examples, the lynching phenomena of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and the rise of the incarceration movement since the 1960s. In both of these cases, 
Uh, they follow successful efforts of African-American uh, enfranchisement, reconstruction, and the civil rights movement because um, of this, uh, you know, we might be inclined to believe that these were reactions that grew out of a state of jealousy. But what shouldn't be overlooked uh, not, is that there are ritualistic markings in these movements. Lynching, obviously, is perhaps a little easier to understand as a sacrificial ritual because it involved actual mutilation, burning, hoarding of souvenirs like teeth and bits of the victim's clothing. But that is not uh, the full extent of human sacrifice. We should also ask what it meant to be a, a white laborer during the period of Reconstruction. The allegiance to the established order of the ruling elite was built on the premise of this counterfeit social mobility and the establishment of a caste beneath them. The Civil War threatened their relationship to whiteness and jeopardized the fictions that were held by whites about the relationship that was cultivated, the coveted purity standard that were embodied by the elites, and competition over the meaning of what it meant to be white and the allegiance of the white masses to the ruling elites was at an all-time low. In many respects, it was the surpassing of one elite group, uh, the South, by another elite group, the North, and the use of the white masses to achieve that end. But once the war was over, the masses had to be brought back under one roof under the tent of whiteness. All of the problems, all of the social ills identified by whites were then cast onto African Americans who were then hung, burned, or dismembered, taking the pollution with them as ritual victims. These ritual, ritualistic gatherings, which often brought together the social elites into very close proximity with the poorest of whites, collapsing, if only for a moment, the social hierarchy where they were one, which doesn't make them permanently equal, but rather what it does is it reestablishes and reinforces the social hierarchy. And lynching reaffirmed the marginal status of African Americans in the country, but it also returned whiteness to its coveted position as a form of social control. Now, I'm about to get into the slides. I've, some of them have lynching images, which are, you know, I sort of warned you about earlier. So, um, all of these images, there's actually, I'm only using two main ones, they come from postcards, which were printed on site, which might seem surprising unless you recognize, uh, you know, the story of lynching as being, you know, when you think of, of the story of lynching as being just acts of rageful men that were spur of the moment, then it might sound surprising, but they were not. They were carefully planned societal rituals. And these postcard profiteers were able to bring out their machines to the sites of the lynching because they were often scheduled, including notices in uh, newspapers. So this is the first one. It's not terribly graphic because you can't see too much. Right in the center. But I use this one because I want you to see all of the people. Now this is the lynching, 1916. Mr. Washington was a black teenage farmhand who was convicted of raping and murdering a white woman in Waco, Texas. Again, vessel of purity. That's why you see that as a concept all the time. Immediately following his conviction, he was dragged from the courthouse, mutilated and burned before a crowd exceeding 10,000 people, many of whom were young people. How did so many people know to be there? Because they knew this was going to happen. Now, this next image is actually quite uh, graphic. So if, it, if you think this is going to trigger you, then here we go. Now, what do we see in this photo? Suits. So, they're smiling. So I'm going to forward it just so we can. They're not hiding their identity. Look how nice this guy is. Yeah. And then we get to this guy. Yeah.
two classes existing very close together, brought together by the burning of a man. This is Will Brown, who was the sacrificial victim who was offered up to quell a riot that was taking place in Omaha, Nebraska, 1919. The riot began in the meatpacking stockyards. The meatpacking stockyards, uh, the plants, employed mostly white women who went on strike for better pay and better working conditions. In retaliation, the plant owners hired black strike breakers. The conflict was then redirected away from the owners and onto the black strike breakers. The Omaha Bee, which represented a political machine that was opposed to the newly elected reform mayor, had a series of articles highlighting black criminality and attacks on white women. In September 25th, a sensationalist media report of the alleged rape, again, always this, 19-year-old Agnes Lubbock was published and Will Brown was arrested, even though Agnes Lubbock couldn't possibly identify him, couldn't positively identify him. It's, well, uh, actually, the whole concept of fake news is the same thing that I'm talking about. It's the same thing. It is, it is not a new concept. How do you steer people away and, and, and guide them into a position that where you can control them? while you steal from them. I mean, we are witnessing right now plunder go on uh, and white people willing to sign up for it. A majority of white people, men and women, signed up for this plunder because we were told racial stories. The rise of the prison ind industry serves the same function. Since the Civil War, our nation has reunited as a union of states under a central authority recognized by all but the fringe elements. By the 1960s, ceremonial lynchings uh, that unified white consciousness had fallen out of favor, but the need to diffuse competition between whites remained. The civil rights movement of the 1940s and 50s and 60s threatened the ruling class by uniting people across racial lines. So Martin Luther King wasn't murdered after the um, bus boycott. He was murdered when he started protesting Vietnam and started the Poor People's Campaign. The response of the incarceration movement, let me see here. So from 1925, the first year of good statistics through the 1970s, incarceration rates were relatively stable at 100 per 100,000 residents. By 2013, the incarceration rates had ballooned to over 700 per seven, uh, sevenfold per 100,000 uh, in prison and jail. It's the highest incarceration rate in the world. The incarceration rates uh, by race grow increasingly stark, whites around 380 per 100,000, blacks being incarcerated at around 2,300 per 100,000. And when we isolate for gender and age, the uh, numbers jump again. By 1970, African American, in, in, before 1970, African American men were uh, about equal to white in the percentage of their population being arrested. Uh, uh, or put in jail, uh, 100 per 100,000. By 2013, 4,400 black men were incarcerated per 100,000 to every 680 white men. And when you isolate for age, for men between 25 and 29, blacks are incarcerated at roughly 9,000 per 100,000 to 1,400 for whites. That is, black men are now incarcerated at a rate of uh, six and a half times that of white men. And although the rise in incarceration rates we've all, with them, we've also seen the stripping of voting rights, access to college loans, employment opportunities, housing. What we are seeing is legislation, same as we saw under the plantation system, that is done to intentionally create a permanent black underclass within our society of marginal people that can be exploited for the use of white elites that, use, that manipulate working class whites. The incarceration movement has just become the new mechanism for alienating African Americans within our society while still retaining them within it as a useful tool. 
It has been said that the origin and the intention of the prison system was to transform the criminal. However, the intention of the incarceration movement is to isolate impurity through a ceremony of objectification that does not seek to transform him, but to keep him as a symbol of pollution against which the white elites can mobilize the white masses either through fear or revulsion. It was as it was with the lynching. With lynching, the criminal body has become the new source of instruction for white Americans. Families used to take their children to lynchings to teach them about what it means to be white. Today, we learn who we are through the television, our media. Uh, our media is our source of instruction for learning that black males are dangerous, polluted, and bad. It is more than just an assault on the black community. The incarceration movement, like lynching and like slavery, serves as a teaching tool for white people about our identities. It is about where we learn where purity is located, where goodness is lo located. It contributes to a belief system that anchors ourselves within, organ within an organized environment of dirt and cleanliness, of pollution and purity. And when we look at criminality or pollution in society, we often focus on black people, particularly men, but we do this to reflect on our own nature as whites. It is a fulfillment of our creation story to the degree that we continue to believe in whiteness and in the multiple areas of our identity that are informed by whiteness, this is the result that we can expect. Whiteness requires these types of results. Now it's, it's easier to see patterns in history and to draw lines towards logical conclusions. It is harder to analyze contemporary events to place them within historical patterns. But I think it's worth just a, a final minute to look at two important movements that were serendipitously occurring at the same time. So we had Occupy Wall Street movement, which led to the rise of candidates like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren. And then you had Black Lives Matter movement for racial justice. On the surface, they may seem only to be tangentially connected through their association with progressive movements. But if we look at Occupy, as, a, as, a, as evidence of intra-white competition, as a rebellion right, of uh, working and poor uh, people and a disenfranchised younger generation who no longer see value in the allegiance to the white elites, perhaps there is more uh, connection than we give credit. The rise of uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, uh, perhaps best associated with a frustration with the corruption occurring around Wall Street and the high levels of political office, and seemingly an unchecked income inequality in our nation. The fact that uh, Bernie Sanders very nearly won the nomination for the Democratic Party is pretty remarkable, given our class consciousness in this nation. Just previously, a year or two being called a socialist would have been a label that wouldn't, would have been a non-starter, but not this last year. And the allegiance to traditional narratives has broken down. Additionally, the media offered a tremendous amount of effort highlighting the difficulty of Sanders to attracting black voters, which was partially true, uh, at least in the early part of the election cycle, but nevertheless served as a, a wedge conversation between class consciousness and race consciousness. Occupying simultaneously is the Black Lives Matter movement, which focuses on the killing of black people, particularly black men, by the police. And it's not that black men are being killed at a higher rate by the police today than they were 10 or 20 years ago. It is that black people, uh, <laughs> and it's not that they haven't organized against police brutality for decades and centuries since the slave ship. They have. Uh, and without wanting to give uh, white people too much control over the narrative, I think there are two important developments that have helped Black Lives Matter as it relates to white consciousness. First is the development and the spread of uh, social media that has democratized the media field and people of all races uh, no longer depend on elite institutions for their social narrative. And we can see this through the use of camera phones, news, however it happens. Uh, and the second development is a crisis of allegiance. The police for many years could depend, uh, even being be given the benefit of the doubt when it came to dealing with black men. And our education as white people has taught us about social pollution of black people uh, while simultaneously training us to understand the police as our friends. But we might uh, hear the words of Thomas Wharton Baker again, 
Referring to the plantation system, he said, the immediate control of the Negroes fell almost entirely into the hands of white men of humble means. The police force, among other things, is a social regulator used as a vehicle for controlling black people, in particular black men. And the killing of black men by the police force is not a symptom of a few bad cops, but is a system that is designed to do this. But white people, who mostly live in se uh, segregated communities, now have the opportunity to see the regulation process and actions, and it conflicts with our narrative as an ethical society. This has led to a lot of dissension within the white people who are being forced to choose between a narrative. Do I believe the police? Do I believe what I see? And there's a loss of faith that is going on. Now, I want to wrap this up. Um, the successful continuation of the white masses will depend the, regula the successful continuation of the regulation of the white masses will depend on undermining the Occupy movement and will depend on undermining Black Lives Matter. The legitimacy of Black Lives Matter within the culture threatens the traditional forms of social, social regulation. You know, who gets to stand up, who gets to kneel at a football game? Well, you don't get a job if you kneel. Although we just had a vice president who wouldn't get up for the Koreans. I'm just saying. <laughs> it remains unclear to us whether or not social elites will be successful in cleaving the white masses away from identification with blacks, but the survival because the survival of the elites at least depends on it. So I actually I expect over the this Trump presidency to see more racialized language and the use of more ritual sacrifice uh, in the upcoming years, not less of it for the social elites who are really trying to rein in and regulate the white masses away from a class consciousness and to deflect intra-white competition over resources. Thank you for your time. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, we're just going to open the floor for questions. Um, so if anybody has any questions, comments. Keep it up there. Yes, my question is, is who do you think is leading the construct that Trump is following? Uh, is it the Koch brothers? Is it the Banyan? Or he's not, he's not smart enough to figure it out himself. <laughs> Let's face it. So who, who's behind the scenes with the Wizard of Oz? Yeah. No, Trump is like the raging id of white consciousness, right? Um, you know, on some levels, it's not, I don't think there's like a, a cabal that's like, oh, you know how we can get white masses? But I'm not saying that doesn't happen either. Uh, and I do think that it's, you know, the Koch brothers have become quite famous because of all of their money, but there are many who are involved in this. And some that, you know, we really, um, we don't, you know, is the New York Times involved? On some level, they are. On some level, they are, right? Um, to the degree that we never counter this narrative, and you are the most one of the most powerful media sources, you know they, the New York Times gets labeled a, a left paper by these people, but it doesn't mean that they're not also invested and that they're not also white elites. So it's not for me. It's not just the Koch brothers. I, there's God, this Democratic Party is is riddled with people who want this to happen. They, they don't, the Democrat, I'm not convinced that members of the Democratic Party want the system to change so much. They, it works pretty well, <laughs> you know? Uh, 
So it's, it's not just them, it, it, but there are white elites all over the place who benefit. I have a question here, mm. or a comment here. Um, what you're saying is totally true, and it's all economically based and stuff from my vantage point, you know, and uh, even the imprisonment of, of black men and stuff as the sacrifice is designed to hoard more riches at the top and stuff because it's, it's taking a lot of the labor, the jobs away from the people of this country, but we don't recognize that. We simply recognize that law and order is being achieved and stuff, and we bought into the hype that, you know, there's something wrong with black people, that they commit crimes and stuff, you know, to that extent, so they should be arrested. And uh, so we have to grow out of that black, white, or the way we look at one another. And um, because we've all been indoctrinated, you know, so deeply, you know, with this black, white, you know, this good, bad, this dichotomy thinking and stuff, you know, we will have to view ourselves totally different. And we will then probably need to recognize ourselves from the spiritual standpoint and how we, you know, manifest ourselves, our attentions, you know, through our virtues. I mean, because it will take something that's totally transformative and stuff in order for this to change because we've been indoctrinated very deeply as a country. So we need to take another look at how we're going to approach it. I agree. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, is he, is, I'm is wondering. Is he a white elite? You're just yeah. taking it back? Yeah. Old white guy. Yeah. So I'm wondering if at the end of the struggle, uh, where we have collateral damage done to uh, black people, poor white people, gay, lesbian, transgender, the evil du jour, uh, mm -hmm. if we're not led back to kind of a Marxian situation where under the current economic structure there is no hope for any type of equality across uh, societal bounds. So, well, you know, there's a lot of Marx and uh, Marxist analysis in here. I'm I'm not a pure materialist, in, in the way Marx is. Uh, you know, what um, a friend just said a minute ago. Uh, I do think that there actually is a spiritual component to, you know, just as this is a, the whiteness is a spiritual component. Understanding how to let go of that is also some sort of spiritual process. I don't have a a plan for you to follow, but but um, you know, there's plenty of plans out there. But um, something about the, the en encountering a transcendence where you come through the whiteness on the other side, I, I think is, is not, you know, that's where I, I break away from the Marxists. She's, she's, been, she's been right on it, yeah. I, um, this question is motivated in part because I'm reading uh, the recent book by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, we were eight years in power. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could say something about um, placing Barack Obama into this framework. Where, where did he come from, or how, how do you explain it? Yeah, well, uh, Barack is fascinating character, right? Some of them I love so much. Love him. Some of them are like, wow, I bought that whole thing. And it's war on drugs kept rolling on. You know, prisons kept rolling on. Deportations kept rolling on. Um, Barack Obama. I, love, I could listen to him all day long. I uh, love him. Um, and it doesn't mean I'm not disappointed. What I think is so interesting in terms of this analysis, right, is he also represents a breakdown in, um, in allegiance to ruling elites. Now, he didn't get white males, but I think he got white females. And um, which is truly a crisis for white ruling elites if all of a sudden you have these white women voting for a black man. Uh, it represents a breakdown in the concept of what alleg where allegiance lies. Um, and then we had this swing right back in the other direction, which, uh, you know, the part of the Republican, 
party, and I don't, I don't want to put it solely on the Republicans, part of the response to Barack Obama for all of the years that he was in there was, how do we get uh, these white people back in line, particularly those white ladies back in line, which they did. Uh, kind of interesting to vote for a guy who's not really lady friendly. Just to say that. Uh, it's, it, is, it is a very interesting movement of allegiance. So there was a breakdown there. And, and then this is the response that we're, the recovery that is happening for, as whiteness reacts back. Hi, I, I wanted to thank you very much for your presentation. I learned a lot and I'm a little bit depressed, but. Um, <laughs> I just had a comment about something that you said um, several times. As white people, we, and then you proceeded to mention some thoughts about that. As white people, we. And I, I, think, it's in, I think it's important to think about considering saying, for those of us who are white, mm -hmm. or for those of us who identify as white, mm -hmm. because there are people in the room, obviously, who are not white, or sometimes we don't know who identifies as white or not white. So I just wanted to make that comment in order to include everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I just I have some observations and then a question. But so my big takeaway is that the elite need these middle this middle class, the masses, mm -hmm. to have some sort of sacrifice in order to have a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and, and hearing that the, um, the legal system, the jail system, the school system, all of these pieces so really cool. are set up to serve, to give us a purpose to not jump to that top piece or not to the desire to jump to that top piece. So much so that we break down that dynamic, right? The sort of. So, um, so uh, not everybody's going to be at that top level. Um, but what, what the, the desire for whiteness is to create a, a, um, um, a desire for belonging. So how did, the, how did the Irish become white? How did, how did Jews become white? How did Italians become white? Like, where did that all come in? And um, why did, why did the Irish, of which, you know, that's my heritage, why did uh, Irish people decide to want to get rid of all of that heritage so that we could become something new? What was, what's in that desire process? What's, what's a benefit? Why, why, where, where's the benefit for us? Well, there was one. Part of something bigger, better than, also, you know, they, they were degraded, right? So, like, I will... I, Right, I will move from degraded to positive. Um, but in doing so, I also have to agree, like, okay, well, I get in, but you don't. Because you can't have everybody in. So you've got constantly have to create um, a group of people who will never be allowed in and will always be there solely to uh, keep you thinking that one day you might get it. So but you never will. Or Muslims, it's a it's a function that can apply all sorts of different areas. It will continue to happen uh, so long as we desire to stay white. When we desire the, to move beyond whatever that is, like what is what is that process of? Uh, we don't we don't necessarily know what it is because it's hard to conceive because it's really the water we move through. Like who am I if I'm not a white person? Well, truly, I'm not a white person. It's just something we've. It's a complete fabrication that we made up in the last 400 years. So it could be something else. But until we, do, we agree to get rid of it, uh, which might, you know, some people have fear thinking, which means I won't get to keep all of my stuff or, you know, I won't get to keep all my privilege, uh, then we won't do it. So there has to be a higher ethical value. Maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's education, I'm not sure. But so uh, should we go back to animal sacrifice? 
No. So, we should all be vegetarians. So, so the one program that made an impression on me when I was 13 years old, uh, being a Trekkie, mm. was a Star Trek episode of uh, uh, two people that looked the same to me when I first saw the show. One person had half his face is black mm -hmm. and the other half his face is white. Yeah. And I didn't feel so bad because Captain Shatner didn't notice the difference either. He said, but you're both half black and half white. He said, no, he's black on the left side and I'm black on the right. Right. Any so, comment? So, so Star Trek came, uh, it's a brilliant show that didn't last very long, uh, but it came during that period of breakdown or breakthrough, whatever you want to call it, right? It came during that time when white people were really starting to question, what is this that we've bought into? Like, is this really what we want? And then shortly after that, we were like, yeah, that's, that's really what we want. <laughs> to our detriment, right? But uh, it, that's, you know, shows like Star Trek showed up during that time. Just very curious. Come in. <laughs> Thank you. I have uh, several questions. Um, how do you, what do you suggest that we do to um, re-educate or enlighten um, the folks that are not aware of all the, many of the stuff that, what you presented to us today, and how do we reach out to the people who believed in what Mr. Trumpy was going to do, um, and the working class and people who lost their jobs? I went back to eastern Kentucky this summer in Appalachia to meet with families that I knew during the war on poverty, mm -hmm. and um, many of the young folks that were there. I knew they voted for Trump. I did not get into any conversation with them. Mm. Um, I just wanted to hear what they had to say. Mm. And I knew that they were disillusioned because there's no way he's gonna open up the coal mines. Mm -hmm. um, and those families, many of them went off to Ohio and Illinois and wherever, and they got jobs in the factories. I did hear those stories and I knew that. Um, and then those factories shut down and they came back. I did not even take any photos of the families that I saw because it was depressing. Mm -hmm. There was still a lot of poverty. So I have a question. How do you re relate to the young folks today, start in first grade, and how do you reach out to those people like that I saw this summer? And um, you know, I, I, I think that's a major. I know they're disillusioned. Mm -hmm. They said that. But how do you change their thinking in terms of understanding some of the things we talked about today? Yeah. Um, well, and I'm sure that there are people who have better, you know, I, I write words on a page <laughs> for a living. Um, and they're really better community organizers than I am. But um, the hard work of actually sitting with white people who are angry and upset has to be done by other white people. And unfortunately, it's very uncomfortable and it does not happen at a rate that we want it to happen. It's slower. Um, and we don't want to feel bad and we don't want to make other people feel bad. Uh, the process of empathy is going to be the only thing that will get people to open up to the suffering that they're in and, then, and that they're participating in. And unfortunately, the only real answer is we just have to commit to the slow process of conversation. And we have to stay diligent. And, um, and it's not exciting or sexy or anything. It's not like a march. It's a slog. And one of the privileges of being white is we can say, I don't want to do that anymore. And so we have to look at that privilege and say, well, I don't want to do that anymore because these people are driving me crazy. And I'm going to do it anyway. 
And that's the, in my opinion, the only way. God is not coming out of the sky to change the hearts of white people. Or if, if that happens, it's because another white person is sitting across that table for them for like the last six months, being like, I'm not leaving you in this state. Because you're suffering, and, and it's not your fault, and it's not the, the poor black guy's fault either. There's somebody who's plundering right now. Turn off that Fox News, man. <laughs> so, sorry, but it's a long process. That's it, though. This is a very personal um, thing to America, but is it also a human problem? White versus... Well, <clears throat> the process of like creating an outside group that you can uh, murder to create power with an inside group, is wor it's a worldwide phenomenon. I don't... Uh, <clears throat> I don't worry too much about what, I mean, I, I worry about people around the world. I, honestly, it's, I think people complain about social media, but I think social media has actually made us more empathetic because we see what's happening so viscerally around the world. So I care deeply, but, you know, the impact that I can have is, an, is in this nation because, uh, you know, I, I'm from New Hampshire. I can speak to New Hampshire people in a way that um, New Hampshire people are like, oh yeah, shit. <laughs> I can't say he's not from here. I can't, you know what I mean? Like, I, I am you. And, uh, you know, I, I, got, I, I was invited to speak someplace, immigration. And so my family, I'm the 12th generation in New Hampshire. It's quite a long time. And what's so interesting about that story when people say, well, I'm this many people in the generation, blah, 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 is implicit is there is some sort of like, I have more of a right, right? No one has more of a right. Anybody who is here, right, that's who is, has a right to be here. Uh, you know. Um, in 2011, I drove across country with my friend, and he was from Virginia, and we you know, went through Alabama, Texas, up. And I found it fascinating that Fox was a basic cable news channel, and you had to pay to get MSNBC or the other side. Yeah. That's true. It's, it was that happened under Reagan. It was fascinating. Yeah. So every gas station, every hotel, every convenience store, yeah. Circle K, Walmart, whatever, Fox was everywhere to be seen, and there was no opposite opinion. Well you, you, well, you have the other networks, right? So there used to be three, ABC, NBC, CBS. CBS. And then under Reagan, Murdoch lobbied to get a fourth, which became Fox. But that's different Fox. So that's how we ended up with Fox. We ended up with the fourth. Well, we have Fox Cable also. That's the well, there's all sorts of... Well, there's a lot. Yeah. But I have a, I have a question with regard to that. Um, are you encouraged by social media? And how do we change the rules so that there's a, there's a network in the South that mm. is as predominant as it is in the North? Because it's, it's not there. A network of what? Uh, uh, the Internet. You know, there's a lot of oh. counties down in that have the only access they have is basically their their library. Yeah, I, I don't I, I can't speak on that because I just don't know. Yeah, um, I just was working in North Carolina this last year, and um, I was working in a very red county. Um, that's the Republican one, right? Red. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I always kind of forget, but um, my team. Um, Everybody had internet there, but uh, so social media. Social media is amoral. It's not good or bad. Uh, uh, I, I I fell in love with the Arab Spring through social media, which would, never would have happened, right? Like, uh, and at the same time, uh, this last election was. Uh, influenced heavily 
social media. It's, it's amoral. Um, but I do think it's a powerful tool and that we should use it. Um, I think nothing is as powerful as one-on-one -on -one conversations. So, you know, trying to figure out how to talk to the people who, you know, when I look at a Trump, when I look at a, a person who does not have a lot of resources and is voting for, uh, I, don't get me started on the Democrats either, but like who's voting for some of, you know, Trump. Um, there's a lot of suffering there. So how they're living with a counterfeit identity that is, has been entirely undermined. They're not entirely sure who they are. So how do you go support them and help give them a vision of a new world? Well, you can start with someone closer. Don't start with the one that hates you the most. Right? Start with someone closer than that. Someone who hates you just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, someone who hates you less than the others. I uh, just want to say it's just really good to hear someone white addressing these issues. Uh, they haven't always uh, been only black people who have addressed these issues, but um, at times um, it, it, it gets tiring raising these issues as a as an intentional black man uh, living a, uh, an intentional life in, get, in, in, in community. Uh, so it, it gets tiring. So thank you. I appreciate and, and I see in your presence uh, hope and progress. Um, my friend Nancy was, who was asking about how to change the hearts and minds of those she met and re-met uh, in Kentucky. And, and I've been praying about this. I've been praying that God would help me to understand what this time, what these times are, and what we should do, what I should do, what we should do, uh, what, what is our part. And I thought your answer was very wise because not everyone can be a political activist or a community leader, community organizer. But what I have seen is that wherever change occurs, be that in an individual's life, be that in any circumstance, it is inevitably because of some one-on-one -on -one interaction. It's because of a connection. It helps me to understand those who say that God is revealed in relationships. But I just, for this purpose, since I'm not preaching, although I did preach, and maybe that's why I'm going off so long, but <laughs> it's an occupational hazard. I, I thought I finished my sermon, but Amen. <laughs> that's encouragement, not finality in my tradition, just so you know. <laughs> that's encouragement, okay? <laughs> be careful, be careful. Ah, I'm getting riled up here. Don't let me stand up now. What was I talking about? <laughs> Connection. Connection and change. So, uh, Nancy, as much as you can live authentically with those people, uh, then, then you will be the agent of change in their lives as long as their hearts are open. And I really do believe that if we have authentic connections, we help hearts to stay open. Uh, so each of us has to do what God has given us to do. We have to be good stewards of our gifts, whatever those gifts are. You know, like it's encouraging to see how many of you are here. You know, I mean, this is not really a sexy title. Black men is ritual sacrifice for the creation of white identity. You know, you got to want to come and, and think. Uh, that, uh, that is You answered the challenge. Uh, you know, I, I missed most of it because I, I preached and, you know, we go along, you know, 11 o'clock. We weren't done until 1.30, so I... You know. <laughs> And it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. Well, not entirely. Not entirely. It's on YouTube. I don't know. It might be. It actually might be on YouTube. Anyway, I get distracted now. Don't, don't distract me. Uh, but but, but I, I really do believe that, uh, uh, that we have to be very intentional now. I think this is a time for being intentional about our connections 
and about our speech and about how we live. And as much as we can lean into those we have contact with who do not agree with us, lean in gently, but lean in, ask the questions. Uh, don't let them get away from you. Break through the barriers. Uh, I, I don't believe we're going to look for, we're going to see much hope in the government for the next few times. It's going to be on us. And, uh, and, and educating ourselves, thinking deeply, uh, answering the challenge to these complex issues. Uh, as much as you're able, living authentically with people and increasing that circle of intimates as much as you can, to me, that's what we all have to do, and that's what we have to do now. When so much is threatening, all that does pull us together. We have to be the ones to take responsibility for making sure that does not happen, and that attitude does not rule the day. We must live in community, and we must do so intentionally. Yeah. My daddy was a preacher from Kentucky, where I was born. That was my first way of talking. Well, it's still in there. <laughs> But what I wanted to say, to really actually back what he's saying, but I want to thank you for bringing up something very important. One of the things that I've been learning to do in my lifetime is how do we sit with others? How do we do what you've just been saying, the connection? <clears throat> now I have, I, I learned, uh, went to Israel, and worked with people on both sides, sitting in the room with both sides, and listening to their stories of how they truly care about one another, and how they really want the best of both worlds in their culture. And I, that reminded me so much of being this little girl and living in a place like Kentucky at that time, that that's how you do it, is you sit one-on-one -on -one and you listen and listen and listen. And there is something, if you, anybody wants to look it up, it's a great learning experience. It's called Compassionate Listening. You can find it online. Nope. Something or other. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to thank you for bringing up that whole idea because it is so very, very important that we do learn to shut up and to listen and to walk in another person's shoes. And I, I want to build on what the, the pastor just brought up, which is... Um, the need for white people to get out there. And one of the, the organizing principles of whiteness, right, is that we have always been this type of, the oppressor people, right? But there actually have always been people who've been in resistance. And the more we can learn about those people uh, who were in resistance, the more comfortable, more comfortable we feel standing in the tradition of resistance. So learning who uh, William Lloyd Garrison was, learning who Ann Braden was, learning who, um, sorry, what? John Brown. John Brown, learning who John Brown is. I mean, we should all have a poster of John Brown in each of our homes. Uh, like, what, how, how would, what would it be like to have a picture of uh, John Brown in our homes? How would that orient our worldview? That we say that I'm not in the tradition of uh, George Washington. I am in the tradition of John Brown. Uh, it would be a fundamental a, 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 a choice to be moving in a di different direction. So, learning the resistance as well. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your words. And, and I think the economic approach, the class approach is extremely important because, uh, thank you for, for emphasizing that. I just want to inject one good news story in the midst of all of this, the sad stories. And that is in 1960, one 
quarter of 1% of marriages in America are black and white. Today, that is 15%. Mm -hmm. That stayed with me when I heard that. That's extremely important to know that. Second thing is, a couple of years ago, I went to the only museum of slavery in this country, Louisiana, the Whitney Museum. Yeah. I'm returning there in a couple of weeks. I experienced a crisis there. It was transformative for me. So that's what I am going to use when I approach white people. I'm going to use that visceral experience, but also the economic one. I think mm -hmm. together we have to do both. So thank you again. Yeah. No, I agree. I think the, the more that we add pilgrimages as well into our lives, again, this is just the preacher in me, right? But going to see the sacred sites is actually quite important. So uh, after Thanksgiving, I flew down. I did a solo retreat on Stone Mountain, uh, a, a, an atonement retreat of, of repentance. Because that is uh, the site of the formation of the clan. And so I sat, I prayed on Stone Mountain. I took a day of, of prayer on Stone Mountain uh, just so... Uh, you know, I can listen to the ancestors, but the, the, the clan ancestors who live inside me as well, right? Because I, I, I don't get to choose which ancestors lived in there. They all live in there, including those ones that brought that into the world. So um, I think some of, additionally, some, some ritualistic behavior of going to the sacred sites is important uh, for us to, to really think about repentance, atonement. What do we do? Reparations. Exactly. Hi. My name is Jack Panopoulos, and uh, a couple of observations before I get a question that relates to you. Um, first is, uh, you know, uh, the name race, racist or, or the concept of racism is thrown around so much that it's almost been desensitized. But I, I think it's useful and instructive that Racism is not who you are, it's something that you do. It's an activity, it's what you say, it's how you act. And recently our president described emerging countries in Africa as shitholes. And uh, he followed up by saying that he's the least racist person that you know. <laughs> so you have uh, the heartbeat of racism in America is denial. Uh, yeah. and, and he typifies that. Um, I just saw recently, for the second time, because the first time it goes by so quickly, the documentary, I'm Not Your Negro. Um, yes. Wasn't that wonderful? So there's a part where, uh, it, from the Defiant Ones, where the, uh, uh, where, uh, the, the um, character played by Tony Curtis is trying to get onto that train. And Sidney Portier is extending his hand. And I imagine, as... When I saw that movie for the first time many decades ago, and then seeing it through the lens of a documentary, which had an obvious purpose, I realized that I actually saw that many decades ago very differently than I do now. And I was hoping that Sidney Poitier would actually get Tony Curtis's hand and pull him up. Um, and, uh, and I was very happy when he jumped off the train when he couldn't pull him up. And now when I see that, I wish that Sidney Poitier's character had stayed on that train and Tony Curtis had gone off into the distance for whatever life awaited him as he was caught by the dogs that were chasing him. Um, and I often wonder when people of color do finally, generations from now, rule this country, how they're going to treat white people. But my question for you Maybe not so much for you, because I don't know if you have a congregation, um, but it is for, uh, for all of us sitting here mostly who are um, not, who would not describe ourselves as color. Um, Martin Luther King about 55 years ago said the most segregated hour in America is noontime. Um, all of us have had the opportunity and occasion to be at a party or somewhere where you've heard unelegant things about our black brothers and sisters, and we've remained silent. Um, many of us attend churches which are predominantly white. How do you address the issue of the whiteness of Sunday, hmm. considering vis-a-vis -vis your topic today? Well, it's a complicated, I mean, there's lots, lots, lots of things. Uh, if you haven't seen, um, Oh my God, the name just went, uh, I'm not your Negro. I am not your Negro. Yeah, I'm not your So the James Baldwin, like, great, 
movie. Also, serendipitously, or perhaps not, <laughs> he, the same director just released Young Marx, which is the lead up to the Communist Manifesto. So here he is in his two movies uh, talking about race and uh, class. Uh, just saying. Um, as for the church, so the black church is a sanctuary from white people. Black people in New Hampshire and elsewhere have to live around us all the time. And uh, very rarely are they operating in spaces that they control. It's usually controlled by white people. Black church is controlled by black people. And uh, it is a great sanctuary <laughs> from white people. It is, a, it is a place where you can just sit back and breathe. Now, doesn't mean the black church is the greatest end-all, be-all thing. It's got problems, too. I'm sure brother would say not every black church is the pinnacle of, of every, you know. But, uh, amen. amen. <laughs> but, uh, black people need to go someplace where they're not dominated all the time by the of white people. So there is this really interesting th thing within the white churches to be like, you know, it would be so much better if black people were here. Uh, which it, maybe it would be better for the white people. Because uh, maybe white people would feel better about themselves. That they, you know, we weren't existing in a place that... Uh, was so white, obviously, uh, even though most of our, we don't say that about the workplace. God, this is such, this workplace is so white, we need to really get, we need to get half black in here. Then it would be a really good white workplace. That would be, that would be a really interesting conversation, right? And, and the black churches would probably be very supportive of that. Uh, so when I think about the, the white churches that want to be more diverse, Again, on one level, nothing wrong with it. Uh, in places uh, like Portsmouth, which don't have a huge black population, I think it's support, being supportive of places that allow black people to be black people with no other white people around, I'm very supportive of that. Um, now, ally work within the white communities is also very important. So how do you team up with black churches to talk about what's the work that we have to do? What, is, what does our God have to say? What does our faith orientation, if we don't use that word, uh, have to say about this thing called racism in our culture? How, how do we use our hour on Sunday to get free from this uh, thing called white that is literally ruining our lives, even though we think it's not? because we don't get pulled over by the police. But it's not, it's, it's killing us. So how do we, how do we actually part, be in part, strategic partnership against the abolition of whiteness? Uh, would be more of my interest. Now, you know, I used to be a pastor in Brooklyn and, uh, and in Queens, and it was more, um, it, you know, the issue of diversity was more of an issue there because our, our neighborhoods were much more diverse, so when you were all white and your neighborhood was not all white or even majority white, then perhaps you were keeping that space white intentionally. Um, and that, that's a different conversation. Um, but here in New Hampshire, I'm very supportive of um, not trying to get convinced black people to join your church because maybe they need an hour or two, or two and a half <laughs> uh, away from us just saying that that might be an option there but ally work is good I think okay we'll take one more question meet me halfway Kevin <laughs> I need the exercise <laughs>
Uh, thank you. I'm going to have to address that comment about black people ruling the world. We are not trying to rule the world. We are seeking equality and job employment, housing, whatever. We're trying to just be equals to everybody. Nobody wants to rule the world. Nobody's trying to be a king. Nobody's trying to be a queen. Nobody's trying to take over. You give people equality, there's no means to take over. Okay, we'd like to thank you all for coming out on this rainy afternoon, but it's not snowing. <laughs> I'd like to thank Reverend Marr for your presentation. It was absolutely informative and wonderful. And we appreciate it. And she needs no introduction, <laughs> Jerry Ann Bogus. Thank you. Close us out. So just some thoughts for you to take home as you go um, away from this conversation. Um, first of all, thank you for participating in this conversation because it wasn't comfortable, pleasant, pretty. So your willingness to participate in uncomfortable dialogue is commended. And I'm really grateful for that because that's the kind of talking about race, racism, and these issues are not pretty. So our conversations won't be pretty. So thank you. Um, I learned something today, um, so thank you. Um, you know, we're in the process of talking about the erasure of blackness and d d disappearing and bringing blackness back into, into our history. And what I saw today with the opening picture is the erasure of whiteness to tell a story. So that made me, when I leave here today, I'll be looking at it through a different lens, so thank you. Um, I also am really pleased with the, uh, the idea of authentic connections. I think if we can leave here today with just that note of making authentic connections, then we stand a chance, a real good chance, of moving the needle a little further to equality of what we want. And I think those were the, the points that I want us to leave with today, so thank you so much for joining us. We have that Lenten program, I'll re remind you, starting on Wednesday. So that's a form of meditating around these issues. And also we're back here next Sunday um, dialoguing about actual uh, monuments and their representation. So thank you so much. We'll see you then. Thank you.